Okay, hello all and welcome back from break. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the conference today so, so far. Um, my name is Sharon Wallet, and I am joined here today with my colleague, Samuel Katara, um, and we will be introducing this panel. Um, the two of us are actually co-founders and editors of Yale Africa Startup Review, which is a publication that features founders and startups shaping the future of Africa with entrepreneurship and innovation. We are both very passionate about business in Africa and excited to introduce this amazing panel of women who will spend the next 40 minutes discussing their perspective and experience in fashion and business on the continent. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Katara to introduce our first panelist. Thanks, Sharon. So, uh, Olafun Milayo Hayandibadjo is the CEO of Patrick Ayansky. It's a leading fashion and textile company in Nigeria. And she's a creative director of Ayansky Fabric UK. She has over 20 years of experience in business management, consulting, leadership, and has experience conducting business in Africa and the UK and Europe. She also sits on the board of several financial services stations, and she'll be a panelist today. Next, we have Beatrice Chator, uh, who is currently a trade and services senior expert in the AFCFTA Secretariat and works on the negotiations for the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area. She has over three decades of experience as an international trade lawyer, specializing in providing advice and support to African governments in their engagement with regional and international trade policy processes. And our next panelist is Aditu Tusani. Uh, she's currently the Chief Commercial Strategy Officer at CNI Leasing uh, PLC, and she's an MBA candidate at Business School in the Netherlands. Her career spans over two decades, and she has expertise in sales and marketing, product development, strategy formulation, implementation, and also in corporate communications and human capital management. Prior to her position at CNI, uh, Adituti was uh, Chief Operating Officer at Career Plus Services Limited. And last but certainly not least, the facilitator for this panel, Dr. Ayo Tunde Uko. Dr. Uko is the CEO and Creative Director of luxury fashion accessories brand Ayo Uko. She is also a British trained general practitioner, an entrepreneur, and a women's advocate serving as vice president of the board at YWCA Lacrosse in Wisconsin, United States. Her global experience spans business management, strategy, healthcare, quality, and clinical medicine. Well, let's give our panelists and facilitate a virtual round of applause. Uh, feel free to unmute or uh, use your emoji button. Uh, and over the course of the session, please feel free to use the Q&A button to ask questions and also ask them during the last 10 minutes of the panel. We hope you really enjoy the discussion and I'll hand it over to Ayo to take it away. Thank you so much, Samuel and Sharon. Hello everyone, and a warm welcome to this very special panel with phenomenal women who lead in Africa. Adetutu, Beatrice and Ulufu Milayo, I'm so thrilled and honored to share this panel with you today. A few months ago, I received uh, an invitation to submit a proposal for a panel session at this inaugural conference. And I was thrilled when the panel proposal was accepted. You see, the confluence of leadership, business, and society has captivated me growing up in Malawi and in Nigeria. Today, you'll get a glimpse of this nexus through the reflections of these exceptional women. So join me in elevating them and their stories. Diving right in. In a report by McKenzie, in a scenario in which women and men play identical roles in the labor market, Africa could potentially add 1 trillion to its collective GDP in a period up to 2025. Economic opportunity and empowerment can enable gender parity. The first question goes to Fumi. So Fumi, you are a successful businesswoman and a serial entrepreneur. You also serve as a non-executive director on a couple of boards in Nigeria. Can you describe your business to our audience? Thank you very much, Ayo. It's a pleasure to have me here. I'm, um, I'm really thrilled about it. So my business is Patrick Anyoski, and what do we do? We basically supply the fashion industry in Nigeria and in wider Africa. Most of our operations are in Nigeria and Ghana. 
um, where we have a split of 70 to 30 percent and we have all the continents that we also supply to. We have a few distributors, probably about 30 and about um, 20 um, odd staff operating from our Nigerian office mainly. Um, we used to have a rep office in the UK in Victoria, uh, but we had to close it down due to the COVID. So in a nutshell, that's what I do. Um, supply stuff to fashion designers and anyone that manufactures. Mainly our main product is really the fact that we do African prints on every texture apart from cotton wax. So you can have your, like what I'm wearing is one of our prints, it's on Copio, but basically we're trying to portray Africa and take Africa to the world that African prints don't have to be on just cotton wax, but it can be on anything from chiffon silk just like any other fabric or printed fabric thank you thank you can you describe what economic opportunities have been available to you and how they have empowered you with some examples please so um some of the opportunity that given this business has done is to be able to not just empower me um, empower my family but also empower other women um, due to the work we do in Africa. So I've spent most of my life in the UK and working with Patrick Kanyoski actually took me back to Nigeria. Um, initially with UKTI as a UK company, then we converted to a full Nigerian company. And the opportunity it has given me is to interact with my own people, with women, Mainly, we do a lot of work from the profits that we make. We do a lot of work with widows where we support over 40 widows. We do a lot of things. Also, we also do a lot of training out there in the fashion industry, which we do voluntarily. So for me, um, this has given me an opportunity to actually support my continent, Africa, in my own little way. Um, in my own quiet little way, without having to actually um, be on maybe a government panel or work for an international company, because I believe that we can all play a part in Africa, and especially in the women's lives. Thank you so much. Now, certain structures in community in communities exist. For instance, uh, culture or religion, and. I'd like to know that um, what sort of structures have sort of either hindered or enhanced your access to this economic empowerment that you have? Have they? Well, some in some sense, it kind of plays a big role, the culture, most especially the working culture. So a lot of time what we battle with is educating, especially coming from the UK, is educating our staff educating our customers about working culture, about you know, the way things should be done. Also generally um, in the African culture, when you're in the fashion industry, it's meant to be a cottage industry. So when you're trying to set up one that's not a cult cottage industry and you're the only woman, it can prove a bit of a challenge because most of the companies that are my competitor on the textile are people that are international companies, like Daviva, Velisco, They've been around for years. They're owned by men. They're driven by men. They, you know, they have a lot of funding from international bodies. So I think culturally, we always have to fight a barrier that we're not a cottage industry. The textile and fashion industry is massive in Africa. We have a chance to actually even explore it more because we're very fashionable and glamorous people. But we've never really been given that support and chance in the rest of the world. We keep fighting a constant battle of trying to actually push that, which we are making progress. There's been a lot of success in the pipeline of fashion designers that have made it to international runways or have started to produce and supply departments or stores. Thank you for me. Could you sort of mention a few things that have enabled you? So for instance, technology is one thing. How has it helped you? So technology was a very key thing to me in the fact that because I'm, I wasn't fully and I'm still not fully based in 
Nigeria, one of the things technology has given me access to is to actually work remotely, especially during the COVID period. Fashion can be very difficult. It's not, a, it's not an essential product. So the only way you can get access to other market is through the internet. So for me, being digitized is a very big part of our business. We, are, we have a, an operation that is fully digitized. We have sales that we're trying constantly every day to digitize from our website, not just relying on social media. So for me, digital is a very big deal. Also sitting down on some of my financial board has also given me the exposure to see from other, you know, gender, like I think one of the boards, in fact, two of the boards, I'm actually the only female. And that has also given me exposure to other, you know, sources of finance and roots and just, you know, trying to help progress the fashion industry as a whole. Thank you so much for me. We'll talk a little bit more about leadership down the line. Continuing on with economic issues, COVID-19 has had a devastating effect in African countries with significant economic fallout. About 80% of income has been reported lost, especially in the informal sector in the early days of the pandemic. We know that the informal sector is made up of mostly women, and in some countries, remedial efforts such as cash transfers and food have been given to them. Stimulus checks have also been distributed, but they're found to have been given to more organized businesses. And these are mostly run by men. So for me, how has COVID-19 impacted your work and your business and other facets of your life? So COVID-19 has been very interesting because no one planned for the COVID. Like I said earlier on, fashion business is not an essential product. So it wasn't the first thing people were thinking about during the COVID. However, a lot of population of the women actually do the fashion business, either as a tailor or designer, or they work in the fashion industry. It's a very big industry that employs. How did it affect our business? Initially, we had to survive. And what does survival mean? This is where the digital era played an impact. This is why the fact that Nigeria had already started transfer played an impact. So a lot of us had to change our strategy. One of the things I also advise people in the fashion industry to do post COVID is it's also an opportunity because there's a lot happening in China where people produce that is making prices go up. So while we had one side of COVID that affected us initially, I believe that Africa can take advantage of the other side, which is um, our minimums are lower than China, our cost of labor is lower than China. Yes, we might not have the raw materials, but there are things that we can work together. Partnership is another thing. We learned to work more in partnership because a lot of, for instance, in the fashion industry, typically in Africa, you give your garment to be sewn every time. Now the African fashion now moved to the ready to wear which is very similar with the European structure. What has that done? It has, it's, for me, it hasn't killed businesses, it's given more fashion businesses opportunity to partner with each other. And one of the things I try and preach to my customers that are mainly tailors and fashion designers is you've got to think out of the box. You've got to think and look at what the other continents are doing. How do we make sure the good thing is we can't easily get things across from other continents. So how do we produce and partner with each other so that our businesses can survive and we can produce more, um, more in the labor force. And one of the strategies I used is this zip company we get zips from in Spain. They actually, during the recession, what they did was that they did a partial manufacturing, which meant some parts of their manufacturing was outsourced to women who ordinarily could not work because of their children. And they were doing that part of it. And it was a very interesting thing for me to have seen in Spain, I think it was in 2018. So I could adopt that process. So it's really about partnership partnership, partnership for us to work together. That's, those are some phenomenal points that you've raised for me. I want to get Beatrice in on this discussion about COVID. So Beatrice, you've had access to Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, and now you live in Ghana. 
What have you seen that is different across these countries with the experience of COVID? Beatrice, Hello. over to you. Thank you. Hello, Ayo, and uh, was really enjoying um, what Fumi had to say. Um, <laughs> and thank you for having me on this panel, I should say. Um, I actually see quite a lot of commonalities in the same way as uh, Fumi has mentioned that, um, you know, people took advantage of the opportunities. Pe people moved their, um, their businesses online. In fact, um, I think it was ITC that highlighted that during the pandemic, um, more online and e-commerce uh, uh, businesses were created. I think they were like, you know, they, they identified about 630 online um, e-commerce platforms on the continent, even in 2020. So there's there's a lot there's a lot of um, opportunity and there's a lot of space. I think actually that um, the uh, and what we will come to talk about the the fact that Africa is now moving ahead to to kind of connect with with itself to to trade with itself is going to provide a huge opportunity to women uh, the fact that um, they are taking advantage of um, the digital space uh, linking with each other online um, also the fact that there are there is now an expansion of fintech across the continent you know about mpesa mpesa yes. has absolutely revolutionized mm -hmm. Um, access to, to financial services for many SMEs. And as we know, um, women tend to head uh, quite a few, quite a lot of SMEs. I mean, the predominant uh, SME is uh, like women owned. Uh, same thing here in, uh, in, uh, in Ghana, you get a lot of women owned businesses. So the networks and the partnerships that Fumi is talking about, we see that, we see people connecting um, more and more platforms, e-commerce platforms are, are coming on board and also e-payments. So for instance, Impesa has um, uh, got uh, PesaPal, um, there's WeCashUp, there's, there's, there's quite a lot, there's such a buzz. And um, I think women tend to be uh, the, the best advocates for each other and um, they tend to reach out and support each other. And um, they seem to be doing that across the continent. And uh, I believe that, you know, we'll see the, um, the dividends of that in the next, uh, in the next uh, year and the decade to come. Thank you. It's a nice sort of pivot into trade, Beatrice. So, uh, you know a lot about the African continental free trade area. Um, we'll call it AFCFTA. Uh, you, you serve as an expert in this area, helping shape policies and um, implementing uh, AFCFTA. Now, the AFCFTA is a trade area founded in 2018 with trade commencing this year. And it is said to be the largest continental free trade area. Um, it consists of 54 out of 55 countries of the African Union. And we've been talking a lot already about collaboration. Well, this is a phenomenal opportunity for opportunity for uh, collaboration to occur across, across countries. Uh, the specific thing here is that each country is, um, is, uh, is to remove 90% uh, sorry, tariffs of 90% of their goods, which allow free access of these com commodities, right? So Beatrice, what's the importance of this trade area and how is it making a difference in the lives of people? It's actually a game changer for Africa. Africans, uh, African countries tended to be exporters of raw materials, the structure of their trade was more um, focused on export to other regions outside of the continent. Um, about say 84% of our exports were geared towards the North or to China or, you know. So um, there was very little trade with each other. Um, and so they came together and decided we need to trade with each other. We want to boost intra-Africa trade. They saw trade as a, a way to um, 
ensure economic progress in effect. And that was what could be done by boosting trade. Um, and at the same time, they want, we wanted to make, the, the countries wanted to make sure that they were very much um, focused on the, um, the goal that had been set out since the 1960s of a unified Africa. So it's not just even trade necessarily, but it's regional integration, it's transformation of societies, it's industrialization, it's um, using or uh, taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. And it's also making sure that no one is left behind. So there's a, a the concept of uh, inclusive trade, making sure that women, youth, um, the disabled, other disadvantaged groups are all part of the picture and participating very much um, in, uh, in, in trade on the continent. So um, tariffs will come down on services, which I, I uh, uh, am, am helping to, to steer. Uh, we will have liberalized um, services in, in, in uh, sectors like uh, information technology, in professional services like uh, engineering, uh, legal, um, medical, uh, architectural, also things like construction, uh, energy services, all of those will be liberalized mm -hmm. through progressive through progressive rounds of, of negotiation. Mm -hmm. So we're not actually saying that it will be done tomorrow, mm -hmm. but there will be a gradual mm -hmm. uh, phasing out of tariffs. There will be a gradual mm -hmm. opening of markets, liberalizing uh, mm -hmm. markets. So this is really, the, um, a very exciting thing for Africa. And uh, we, we hope that it will lead to the development of regional value chains. So just what uh, Fumi was talking about, making sure that the value chains um, are, are created within Africa uh, and that will lead to, to industrialization. It, incidentally, um, the trade that used to happen within Africa was, it was quite ironic that we would export our raw materials outside the continent, but within the continent, we were trading intermediate goods yes. and final goods. So there's, op op there's obviously opportunity there to, uh, to have industrial uh, production and trade across the continent. You know, listening to this just sends chills down my spine because the sort of opportunity to really add value to the products, to the raw materials, you know, of sort of found on the continent is sort of exponential. And I'm so excited to be part of this discussion and to be part of the work that's going on there to really uh, make this a success. So one last question, Beatrice, how can Fumi, who's a businesswoman in textile, and Tutu, who has worked as a logistics um, executive, how can they engage with the AFCFTA? So the AFCFTA is this broad trade ar 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 uh, um, arrangement. It, it already has quite a few uh, state parties. Uh, Nigeria is one. Um, and so it is at the national level that the agreement will actually take life. So, um, Fumi needs to work with her Chamber of Commerce. She needs to work with the people in the Ministry of Trade or Commerce. Um, maybe if there's like under a, the presidential office, there might be something on innovation or science and technology. Um, all of these institutional structures will be geared towards spreading the word, raising awareness amongst the private sector about the opportunities in other markets. So if Fumi wants to export to Botswana, or she wants to export to Mozambique, or to Angola, or to north to Egypt, or to Algeria, all of the information about um, what those other markets, the opening of those other markets will be in the Chamber of Commerce, or it will be in the Ministry. And then, of course, there are other um, in continental platforms that are coming up, such as the, um, the Africa E-Trade uh, group that has this uh, portal called Sukuku, 
um, where it's basically supposed to be this continental online market where you will, you know, you will do business to business, business to consumer um, type of uh, uh, transactions. So there's there's a lot of it, um, awareness raising that that will be done at the national level. Also, ECOWAS uh, as the um, regional grouping, EAC in in East Africa, SADC. There's information about the opportunities in all of these places for uh, people like Fumi, for people like, uh, like Tutu. Okay, thank you so much. Speaking about information, right. Uh, Tutu, I'm going to bring you in here to speak a little bit about education, our next topic. So in Africa, 90 girls on average enroll in secondary school for every 100 boys. Now, pushing hard for equal education for boys and girls is vital because this enables progress in other aspects of gender equality. For instance, there's a moderate to strong correlation of educational attainment with equality according to studies. When girls receive the same education as boys, they're likely, they're more likely to share unpaid work with men in a more equitable way. They also work in professional and technical occupations and reach top leadership roles in the companies that they work for. Tutu, you're currently studying for a master's degree in business administration. You're pursuing this now with your daughters grown up and pursuing their own dreams. When you look through your life and your career, what role has education played? This is for Tutu. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's evening here in Nigeria, so good evening. Hi. Um, thank, you, thank you for the question. I'll just give a little bit of a background to my story. Um, so I come from a very average level of family, you know, and I lost my dad in 1991 you know, and uh, we are seven children. And, um, you know, it was tough for my mom to cope, you know, trying to train all, all those kids, but of course she had help here and there. And then by the time we were done, we were also able to, to train the, the younger ones that came after us. But the issue is that um, I, I would say I'm lucky because there are a lot of Nigerians don't have that opportunity. Once you lose a parent or you lose both parents. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's the end of um, education for you. Um, we, I think. Okay, Tutu, we've lost your sound. I think a couple of us here went to how you were able to score that high, you know? So it was, it was really tough. And I'm sure that that is what a lot of our students are also going through where they are, but you can't take away the value of education. Education opens the door of opportunities for you. I mean, if you are without that, the door is almost permanently, permanently shut in Nigeria. I always say, what's the difference between Ade Tutu and the, the lady that I buy pepper from in the market? It's, it's the education. She's also smart. She's also hardworking, but she does not have that opportunity. You know, um, I, I will give a, a little example. I used to have a, a maid, a very nice <laughs> girl. You know, she had a um, secondary school level, that's high school level, and then she got pregnant. And I mean, that was like the end for her. I had to let her go. The, the father was irresponsible and everything just went down for her, you know? So I, I just supported her for a few, a few months. And then I remember that, oh, she had high school, you know, uh, diploma. And I was able to get her a job in my office as a sales assistant. And I can tell you that that has changed her life because she's able to pay her rent. She's able to put her child in nursery while she goes to school. I mean, while, while she goes to work, you know, she's able to feed herself. I mean, her life has dramatically changed just because she has that minimum 
um, high school level education. And she's now saying, oh, Auntie, I'm trying to go into, I'm trying to do jam so I can go into university. So, you know, it, it, it creates an opportunity for you to, to be who you want to be, you know. And um, I'll just say that, you know, as, as much as we can help, you know, people in those circumstances to finish high school, you know, that, that, that's like the basic level. If you're able to finish high school, I mean, you have a chance of life in, in Africa. You know, if you now get to university, I mean, you are now topping up, you know, to be, uh, <laughs> to, to face the world, basically. But, you know, as, as much as we can get people to have that minimum level of education, I mean, it, it will change our continent for good. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so sorry to hear about, about dad. Um, and mom. <laughs> and mom, mom. My parents. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, you've raised some really important points. And, you know, I have to applaud you for the personal efforts that you've, you've, you've taken. But what do you think as a community, as a society, as a nation can be done for girls like your house help who you helped? Wow, uh, I, I will say that um, it has to be almost a um, three-prong approach. Number one, um, what, what you find out in our culture as Africans is that we're usually raised by both our parents and we put the community, you know? So we, we need to enlighten you know, uh, uh, the, the folks in the rural areas and the elders in the rural areas, you know, that they need to give uh, girls a chance, you know, to, to finish up, you know, to finish up um, to that basic level of education. And then the government must have, I mean, uh, a, a true desire to move people you know, forward. I mean, what, 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 we, what we hear that happens, I mean, in terms of politics and all that is that, you know, uh, uh, some of the leaders prefer to have a lot of people uneducated because they can take advantage of them. So uh, as, as many um, leaders that we can get, you know, that really has a, 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 a heart for the people, a heart for growth, of people, we, we as a people should try and put them in those places. I mean, we need to vote. I'm, I'm a very politically aware person, you know? So as, as many of them that we can get into those um, situations, we must. Mm -hmm. And then it's also important for, for the corporate community. And I mean, there's a lot they can do. There are many causes that the uh, non-governmental organizations can, can take up in terms of education, I mean, their role is more of, uh, their role is more of, you know, to keep creating awareness and to keep making the government accountable. You know, once we can do this, and, and it, it's, it's I, I would say it's a little step at a time. Um, there, in, in Thank Nigeria you. Now, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Tutu. Yeah. If you wrap, wrap up for me, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, also the quality of education that we're getting now has really gone down. If you want good quality education, you almost have to pay through your noses. So we need to, you know, upgrade whatever we have uh, on the public level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Such important points. And the conversation can go on and on. Um, but I, I want to move on to the next topic so that uh, we can cover this because I think it's important. So we, we're pivoting to executive leadership. Now, one, one bright spot in Africa's efforts to achieve gender equality is in its achievements ensuring representation of women in top executive roles. Africa has the highest female representation at the board level of any region at 25% against a global average of 17% from a McKinsey report. So Fumi's textile brand is one of the most recognizable in Nigeria. I bet many Nigerian women listening own a Patrick Ayangsi design. Um, Fumi, you serve on 
as a board director, right? What has your experience been as a leader in executive leadership? Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I, being a, a woman leader, especially I would share from the board perspective, because not a lot of people are privileged, but just like Tutu, I lost my dad four years ago, and I'm the first child. And somehow I landed myself on what I'll call what I wasn't prepared for at that time, which was to sit on the boards representing the family, especially they were all financial boards, not textile boards. But one of the things I have said, I, I realized that that gave me an opportunity and an insight into some of the reasons why women don't get those opportunities. Some of the way is the way we think, some of the way is the way we process, but most especially, most people that get to the board, it starts building gradually from middle management. Middle management is generally between the age of 30 to 45. Some countries say 31 to 40, some say 30 to 45. The issue with that age is that at that age, you are most likely as a woman like me, having children, mm -hmm. raising them, just about to have them, just finishing up with them, you will just fall under one of those categories. If you don't have them, then you're under the cultural pressure of get married. Unfortunately, that's where we find ourselves as African women, but I also think we can take advantage of that. I think the government and um, different institutions need to find ways like the developed countries have to create avenues to train we women because not everybody has the privilege and opportunity I have in terms of exposures, exposure internationally and being landed this board membership. That has also taught me about how to be able to separate business from my emotions. Women are generally very emotional. I was on a sandbox project mentoring, which is a Canadian um, fund that fund um, African businesses. And one of the things I had to manage as a mentor on that project um, when they gave funding was managing a woman that had a family, a young child, you know, at the same time, you're dealing with the fact that you have foreign funds and you've got to deliver. And sometimes we women, we just have to help ourselves in terms of our emotions to say, what is the most rational thing to do? So that exposure to that board and executive level has helped my decision making. But I would want to see more companies actually support women in middle management. I think if we get through supporting more women in the middle management, we would get more quality in terms of board representation. It would not just be a number on the board to have women, but the women would actually make impact because women have loyalty. That's the truth. They have commitment and a lot of women, when they're happy, they're not going anywhere. So from my experience of that, what I would always say to women is one of the things that has also helped me, not just only the education, I've had to actually expose myself. I mean, I read books that normally men would read, but it's so that I understand the minds, you know, the mind of the people I'm sitting down the board with. So even if I could interpret you know, the figures and the numbers, how do I get across, you know, so I believe in education, not just traditional education, but education through mentoring, through um, groups. I also believe in a lot of exposure. I believe in women opening up their mind and not being so, you know, oh, you know, I'm stuck with this, you know, like I took time off, even with my busy life i took time off from january last year which a lot of people weren't aware of i took time off to come back and stay with my son so it's something that you always constantly have to battle with with women but if we even if we don't find that support which some of us are not privileged to have my family support my husband supports me a lot my family my mom my brothers everybody supports me everybody's like hands on deck um even if you can you can start to read books. I learned how to read. I learned how to 
put my energy into things like tennis when I'm stressed, you know, you can just, and this is all things where I had to basically train myself. I think that women also have to just keep their minds open and most especially expose themselves. And we need to work together. I keep talking about this work together, work together. We shouldn't be in competition with each other because one thing I learned from boards is I always crack a joke. The men have a mini board meeting before the board meeting. <laughs> so all of us are coming for a board meeting. Most of the time, the men have had a mini board meeting in a very informal way over a cup of coffee, well, maybe not quite coffee, but maybe a tennis game, maybe pub on a Friday. And then we're coming in and it's like, what's going on? It's like we're fighting. <laughs> so women have to learn to make good use of their networks and their relationships. It's really, really, really important. Um, and that's what I would say, you know, being on an executive board has helped me to bring on but I think in terms of the middle management, we need to see more companies embrace how they're going to actually help this women through that stage of their lives. And so, and the answer is not, Thank by you. the way, that in a business, because <laughs> most women, women run to that. It's still the same problem. Thank you for me. And no, you're absolutely right, because when you do start your business, then really you're at it 24-7. You know, you never really stop. So it's um, a whole different commitment, but it's, uh, it takes a lot of time and commitment just as a career within a, a corporate setting. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. We'll go straight to inspiration and motivation. So for me, I, I still have you on. So what is it that you would tell your younger self if she was in front of you today in a few words? Very simple. Educate, educate, educate. <laughs> That's it. Expose, expose, expose. Don't take relationship for granted at all. And I think those and always make sure you keep a strong ecosystem around you. Um, very, very important. And that's what I keep telling myself. And that's why I keep reading, reading and reading. I have developed reading as a hobby at a very late age, because that's the only way I can educate, expose myself, but most importantly, relationships are very important. Thank you. And can you name one thing you will do today, you know, as soon as possible to help support a girl or girls or young women in your environment? Um, I, I currently have a strong passion for fashion at the moment and a lot of young girls want to sew I would love to actually create like an organization that would not only give them access to funding but also train them on doing the business fashion there's a difference between being creative as fashion and being and what I have noticed also from my board exposure on the financial front people don't want to touch fashion most equity people don't want to touch fashion. And I know the reason why, because I came into fashion from a finance background. And it's basically because they need somebody to educate them. They understand the creative part, but they need somebody to educate them. So if I found, a, you know, if I had my way now to help, I would look for women that, or little girls that have passion in fashion, but not only just help them in their creative life, but also how to manage their finance and run the business called fashion. Thank you for me. Beatrice, what would you tell your younger self? In a few words, please. I would definitely say to start, if you see an opportunity for advancement, take it. Because don't, don't bother second guessing yourself about whether you're good enough or waste time thinking it through all the way. Just go for it um, because some opportunities are time sensitive, they're unique, they're unique to that time and situation. Secondly, decide what you want and request it because a lot of the time we women don't really have the words, we don't have the capability to ask for what we really want. So speak up, we fail to, to, to speak up and say what we want exactly. And then third, stay connected to your support systems professionally and personally because they will ground you. Definitely. Those would be my three, uh, 
three pieces of advice to my young Thank self. you so much. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Really wise ones. Thank you. Yeah. And Tutu, over to you. What would you tell your younger self? I would have said to young to, to do your MBA at the age of 25, <laughs> not at the age of 49. <laughs> you know, that's one. As I, in, I feel as you. I yeah. adv advance your career early, um, I mean, early on in, 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 your, in your youthful life. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would also agree on, you know, with, with everything that we've seen with COVID, I mean, stay close to the people that you love, you know, tell them that you love and appreciate them, you know, and, and then, of course, um, uh, yeah, so live your life as if this was your last day, you know, basically, you know, so th those would be, those would be my, my, my take. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've had an amazing time. And um it's over to Sharon and Samuel for questions now for the audience. Oh, <laughs> let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll, I can read some of the questions, right? So, Right, my question is to Fumilayo. Why the name Patrick Ayangsi? Okay, very simple. It's actually my husband's name. Like I said, I'm privileged to have a very strong support network, and one of that, um, one of them is my husband. He's not threatened by my success. He likes to encourage me, and I just felt that to also give a kind of um, misery uh, uh, what, what, what what you know some mystery to the name is to name it after him so people can't really figure out that it's a female business i also did that because in fashion industry um at the time i went in about 12 15 years ago if it's a woman's name they will probably just think you know just another woman cottage business but naming it after my husband not only was I achieving two things? His support was a rubber stamp, but also I was creating a brand where people can look at the company and the products independently of maybe it's run by a woman or a man. I think it's very important when you're choosing business names to be very strategic about it and not emotional about it. Thank you so much. Right, let's see, any question, any other questions? My question is to Beatrice. Could you please reflect on how policymaking is responding to the need for state-supported public services to cut the burden of unpaid care work? Hmm, I'm not sure I quite understand that, but, but there are a number of tools that, that governments have to, to provide support. Um, there is a push to try to, to get people, to get um, governments to, to recognize um, carers um, of elderly relatives or disabled people um, as part of the, the public um, uh, uh, account system. Uh, but it's it's a slow process, uh, and I don't actually have the numbers in terms of uh, African countries and what what they're doing. But I know that there's a strong push for that. That would be my response to you. Thank you. There's a question for. Let's see. In your experience, what has been the best way to change attitudes about educating young girls? What has worked to encourage reluctant families? So, Tutu, you can have a go. And Fumi, if you want to chime in. I, I think I kind of uh, talked about that earlier. I, I would say um, information and education, you know, uh, and then you need to get the cooperation of, uh, of uh, the you know, the, the parents and the elders and, you know, the structure that, um, that follows. And then um, 
of course, we after that you need to have some level of enactment. That means it should be a policy, it should be not a law, of course, people bring, you know, but a policy that you know would encourage you know young girls to be in school and stay in school. I will give you an instance in, in Nigeria. You know, there there are they call them um, feeding programs that you know encourages parents to send their kids to school because at least they will get one meal a day that they would have maybe otherwise had have, have to pay for, you know. So as many of those um, kind of initiatives that we can, that would look as if you are benefiting the parents, you know, we, we should uh, consider that. Thank you. You know, you've mentioned some important things because um, I know of a program where the parents are actually being paid a stipend or something just to allow their families some ease, um, you know, for the absence of the girl in the home. So, you know, that encourages them. So, you know, I, I think there's so many creative ways we can really engage with family and the community to really just keep our girls at school. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, let's see, there's another question uh, for me. How do you respond to the, con okay, let's see. Okay, how do you respond to concerns around IP protection in the fashion industry, given Patrick Ayanksi's business model? Um, so it's a very interesting one, again, which I quickly got over. Most creatives are very, very attached to their work. And I guess, again, I'm privileged to stay in the UK and exposure made me research into companies like Zara, H&M, um, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, all their strategies. So there is an element of the fact that you would always have this issue in a fashion industry. But one of the things that we're educating people about in fashion, and this is about the fashion of business, you don't want to spend your whole time you know, chasing after that. You would not just be able to balance your books except you're a Louis Vuitton. And it's very simple. Now, the mistake a lot of people make is this go, oh, but Louis Vuitton does that, but they have a constant battle and they also have diversification in luxury hotels. So when you look, I always crack a joke. If you want to see who is doing the best, just go on the Forbes list. On the Forbes list are people like Zara. They don't spend the whole time protecting that. So you have to do it up to a reasonable extent. We have a scenario recently where we commissioned a work to a designer and very embarrassingly, the designer picked up two of our customers' work and we were not aware. And somehow we found out, luckily this is why relationships matter. Those two designers contacted us and were like, we know that you are, you know, we have a good working relationship with you. We investigated, we stopped using that designer in terms of work for us, but how do you protect that? Which is why I always say, sometimes relationship is good. We have over a thousand designs of ours. If I'm gonna spend all my time protecting that and constantly, I wouldn't be able to exist mm -hmm. as a business. So for me, when it comes to business, I actually almost switch from being a woman to a businesswoman. You know, and I find that a lot of creatives really home. I'm not telling you not to do it, do it, but there is a balance because even the biggest brands have an issue with this constantly. The good thank you. thing, thank the you. Good thing though is I uh, also to interrupt you. Oh, please. Soon there will be an IPR protocol under the AFCFTA. There will be a protocol that will have legally binding obligations for intellectual property protection. So watch this space. <laughs> That's you. awesome. That is so awesome. And um, I, I think it's a, it's a phenomenal way to sort of wrap up on our time together. So in conclusion, I, you know, within the, the synapse of business and leadership in society, women play a pivotal role. We look forward to Africa with its fullest potential realized for all of us. Harnessing value sustainably to create African nations which thrive and that we can be so proud of. 
Thank you, everyone, for attending and participating in this panel. At this time, we're going to have a short five-minute break. If you haven't done so already, please fill out the survey for this panel. The link will be in the box, and we will convene again in about five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aya. Thanks, Fumi. Thanks, Tutu. Really good to be on the panel with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks, Fumi. Nice to see you. <laughs> Same here again. <laughs> All right. Thank you.